That sounds delicious. Okay, it's recording now. Recording, recording. I've got to go outside and do this. I'll be back and I'll leave it recording for a bit. And I'll be back with it and all of that. Understanding, understanding, listening, reply, listening, reply. I love you, I love you, I love you. Listening, reply, listening, reply. I love you, I love you. My TV is going on. Okay. I don't know, I'm nervous, love you, love you, love you, listening, reply, listening, reply, um, Intermix Sector YouTube, Intermix Sector YouTube. It's like, keeps going, like, that's what mobile gaming is, and then it's like, it's cool that you have this graphical power that, like, literally the laptop I'm using now is the first laptop that I've had that can do ray tracing, and so it's wild that, like, my next phone can do that, but I don't know what difference it makes when, when the games are, like, not... Most of them are not very good, and I don't know if, if ray tracing will come to the ones, like the few that are, but we'll see. Well, and I'm assuming Netflix. ray tracing on on mobile phones is not going to matter like at all if you're using something like Game Pass, right? No, no, cloud cloud streaming is its, its own thing. So this is only going to be for games that you can actually play on the phone, and that's going to yeah, be this is not, so... Yeah. yeah, that's... It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think it's so that way they can say that it is. Just because that's a buzzword for gamers. But it also uh, means yeah. that games can be built with mobile in mind using the Unreal Engine or any other engine that natively supports ray tracing. Developers can build it with a mobile endpoint without necessarily having to completely change the lighting situation. Like Obviously, ray tracing quality will be lower and they'll have to scale it, but... It's the same thing as like whenever Digital Foundry compares a Switch release to a PS5 release, right? It's the same game, but those developers have had to redo the lighting completely to remove any real-time lighting or ray trace stuff at all. And it's going to be interesting. I mean, obviously, modern smartphones are way more powerful than the Nintendo Switch today. And I mean, you can, you can look at Apple Arcade as an example here, where some AAA console titles... The license is picked up by Apple and made an Apple Arcade exclusive, and those titles are able to benefit from that investment through the, subs the recurring subscription revenue, and that kind of is more easily justifying that expense. So to me, it's just one more spec until it's proven useful, but it's it's a cool spec nonetheless. It, it, the Unreal Engine 5 was like highlighted several times during the Tech Talk on gaming as well so like it, they're, they're definitely thinking about how those two will tie together so it, it, it's interesting to see what could come from it but yeah until then it's all kind of hypothetical future stuff um did you have poke is the most important question <laughs> yeah i did i had a little bit and then and then friday the, the conference was over but my shuttle to the airport did not leave until like seven o'clock so i had walked down to a hotel a few uh actually where the qualcomm people were staying from what i'm aware but we walked down to a, a nearby hotel like 15 minutes away and got sushi there as well so i ate good it was good very very happy for you <laughs> all right so qualcomm one thing i do obviously have to mention is the orion cpu that they teased yeah we can talk about this very very briefly, because there's not much to talk about. But. So this is the IP that Qualcomm is working on. It's a next-gen CPU that's focused on Windows. So it won't really impact your phone anytime soon. They're aiming at a 2024 release date here. This is really what's going to supersede the Windows on ARM chips that are powering things like the Surface Pro 9 and a bunch of Lenovo 2-in-1s. This is Nuvia IP, which... Um, was created as an offshoot of people that worked on Apple's M series and then left and formed Nuvia. Apple is suing Qualcomm, or at least the lead person who ran the M series development for basically stealing trade secrets and then using them to launch Nuvia. Arm, the company Arm, the, the licensor of the Arm designs, is suing Qualcomm for essentially undermining its agreement around custom ARM chip design because Qualcomm and Nuvia have different deals with ARM based on like what they can change in the overall design of the CPU cores. Very, very wonky stuff here, but ultimately what it has meant is that any movement in the Orion project has been pretty slow, and they're not really allowed to disclose anything right now other than 
it's going to be super powerful and better than anything you've seen so far on a on a computer. Yeah, and and I hope it's true. As someone who uses Windows, you know, it'd be it'd be cool to see that. But but we'll I have a uh, uh, lots of lots of questions. What's just interesting to me though is so. The M1 is released in late 2020. It blows everything away, like out of the water. Rosetta 2, super smooth, works with everything. It's just the transition for Apple to ARM could not have gone smoother. It is now leaps and bounds ahead of everything out there on the Intel side and the Qualcomm Windows and ARM side. And then the M2 comes out, and it's like still really good, but the year-over-year improvements were pretty limited. And they're not making a big deal about the changes in the CPU cores because there weren't that many. And it's really interesting seeing that like TikTok cadence, even from Apple this early on. I don't know what that means. I'm sure it doesn't mean anything. I'm sure the M3 will just continue to be a, a complete monster. But it is something to think about that like Qualcomm has a shot here. And if Nuvia's IP is as good as Qualcomm claims it is, they can pull this off, but uh, it's going to be really tough. Really, really tough. Because 64-bit emulation right now is, on Windows, pretty pretty bad. And uh, not a great look for somebody who just bought like a Surface Pro 9 running a Qualcomm SoC. Well, Adobe is bringing more apps, so it'll all be fixed. Thanks, Adobe. And they're all going to run really well. And definitely Adobe not brought those apps bad. to Mac like a year ago. So... Yeah, they sure did. So obviously, this has not been a great week for big tech. I mean, it's not been a great month for big tech. A lot of layoffs. Facebook laid off 11,000 people. Amazon is laying off 10,000 people. Obviously, Twitter not having... Twitter shrug. Twitter dropped from 7,500 employees to 2,700 this week. And apparently now Elon is hiring some of them back. Employees were putting up like videos of them being like, yeah, I guess we're fired now because we didn't accept those new terms <laughs> like, see you later <laughs> like geez. you're gonna send me a report on friday afternoon at 3 p.m telling me what you did like he's gonna read 2700 oh, yeah. emails yep saw that yeah. that's why he has to fire everybody right because he's not gonna be able to read all those <laughs> those uh roundup emails what a good place twitter's in tesla had to recall 166,000 cars because of a software glitch Oops. but sp- uh you know uh starlink's available in canada and yep. finland so there you go <laughs> one bright spot Every time I hear about the Twitter nonsense and every time I go and just doom scroll on Twitter because that is just what my brain has trained itself to do at this point, I just keep thinking, God, I really miss Google+. Plus. I'm one of about 50 people who does that, but there's never been a better time for one of the major tech companies to try and like break into social media. Because if Twitter is dying, which we aren't entirely sure that it's going to happen yet, because if he turns the company over to somebody else and lets them, you know, run it like an actual company and not just as a dare, hopefully it can recover in some shape or form. And if they want to make Twitter profitable again, they're going to have to actually do content moderation, which will then negate, I think, Elon's reason for buying it in the first place. But Google already has all of your, like, All the things you would put in a profile, Google already has that. It already knows everything about you. And it already hooks in basically everywhere on the internet between YouTube and. (laughs) Stop trying to make fetch happen. (laughs) Honestly. (laughs) Let it it fucking die, Ara. It's not. It doesn't want to be reborn. Do you want Google to kill Google Plus again? Like, That's what I'm going to say. I okay, like they, I don't think people can handle it. No one, no one is going to sign up for a new Google social network. <laughs> no one believes in them. Everyone's going to be like, yeah, okay, and like move on. Yeah. This is not. A, this is not the. This is not the way. I don't. I don't agree with this <laughs> like at all. I can dream because Mastodon's okay, but it's a little bit too like fragmented in irc it's, it's way not, too fragmented yeah it's way too fragmented but at the same time i mean like every there's nothing else that will fill that void properly right, that's the it needs to be a twitter clone is the thing it's it's not enough <laughs> to be like we're we're making a new social network like look at all these ideas no it needs to just be like look we ripped off twitter like we we just but that's what we all just these kinda... clones are like no. there's hive which everybody seems to be I know be I know my entire for. twitter feed is people being like signed up for hive and i'm like I, from what i understand hive is being run by like two people i'm like all right well that's going to die like that's going to be overrun in like 
I'm like, whatever. Like, I'm literally just sitting. I, I joined Mastodon and then closed the app and haven't opened it in three weeks. And I'm just on Twitter until it dies. And then I'll figure out where I go from there. But whatever. It's fine. We're just going to go down with the ship or not. Who knows? Everybody from Europe is just like, don't use Hive. It's not GDPR compliant. <laughs> it's going to steal all your data. They're not going to be able to take down hate speech. Like, do not give these people your information. And then everybody else is just like, I need somewhere to, to go. Like, my house is flooded. Yeah. I don't care if this hotel is full of roaches. I, I, have, I need a bed to sleep in. Yeah. Like, that's basically what Twitter is right now. It's just a lot of, like, very slowly moving lifeboats going out into the ocean, hoping that eventually some island shows up. And, and like, there's no indication right now that any of those islands are not a mirage that will just disappear post dot news. Like wh what? Like not, none of these are actual products. <laughs> Mastodon is the close to a product that we have to replace sure. Twitter. And it is yeah. far too nerdy. It is far too complicated. It'll happen as soon as Linux takes over desktop. Like but that's here, when Mastodon will be. <laughs> here's the thing that we have to realize as Twitter users too. Twitter is complicated. Yeah. Like as far as social networks go, Twitter is hard to use. It's not clear how to benefit from actually signing up and starting to tweet because very few people are going to see your stuff. You basically have a very haphazardly curated list of posters. And like being a poster on Twitter does not always guarantee good content the way that it does on something like TikTok. Most of the posters on Twitter are like weird Twitter users, the ones <laughs> that you really need to understand their accounts to get anything from them. Yeah. It's like starting Ulysses in the middle and going, oh, this is a really <laughs> good book. I'm sh I, I, now I know why everybody thought it was one of the best books ever made. Like, no, <laughs> you, you have to understand why Joyce writes the way he writes in order to read Ulysses. It's just, the whole thing just does not make sense to me. And it, it just feels like I understand it. I empathize with people grasping at straws. I do, but there is nothing to replace Twitter at the moment. And unfortunately, like Musk knows that. Oh yeah, he knows that, and it's annoying. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's, it's annoying. one way to put it. It's annoying. All right, but let's talk about this. I'm gonna try not to activate most people's speakers here, but uh, Amazon's A L E X A is in trouble. There's a report out of Business Insider that it has been a quote colossal failure. It has lost three billion dollars in the first quarter of 2022. The service itself, the assistant, is mostly used for timers and to, to play music, not originally, you know, yes, the way that Amazon intended in 2015, not the way that the company's intended it today, which is a much more holistic presence in your life. We heard the same thing about Google back in October, that it was shifting resources away from its assistant division into hardware. The difference here, it looks like, is that Amazon is seeing losses at both the hardware and the software level, right? The uh, ALEXA division is just kind of flailing. It doesn't really know what it wants to be. And the hardware to support it is also kind of all over the place. There's a million Echo speakers. There's a million Fire TV sticks. There's a million of everything because Amazon throws anything at the wall. But it does feel like the company is a little bit listless when it comes to its hardware division right now. And if you just... Go to Amazon.com right now. You can absolutely see it for yourself. Like, go to the page that basically rounds up all of Amazon's hardware. It's hard to parse, to be honest. Ara, right, I don't know about you. Like, you've been the one really entrenched in this. But what are your thoughts on, like, where Amazon is as a hardware company these days? Well, I think the problem for both Google and Amazon is that AI assistants without true like artificial intelligence can come to some kind of conclusion, can engage in conversation with you that actually makes sense. Being a fan of the 90s and being a Mega Man fan, I've waited most of my life for net navvies to be real. These are not that. And until we have that, AI assistants are not going to be used for anything more than just like the most basic of commands. They're not treating it as a person. They're treating it as a butler they don't have to pay for. <sighs> right. But the thing is that, like, if you only ask your butler to set a timer, <laughs> you probably don't really need to employ that butler because you have a You're phone. overpaying. <laughs> <laughs> you're definitely overpaying for Jeeves. <laughs> um, especially when AskJeeves.com still exists as a portal today. <laughs> True story. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I think the expectation here 
was that we would be a lot further along with Google Assistant and A than we are in 2022, right? So the Nexus 4 turned 10 this week. Amazing phone. I was looking up videos of my, like I, I did a video review for my old job at Mobile Syrup on YouTube. Terrible video. Please don't watch it. Also, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it right um, after. It's incredible. <laughs> but one thing I noticed was that Google Now was part of the operating system even back in 2012, right? So Google has been playing and dabbling in this for a very long time. And obviously it wasn't quite as full featured as Assistant today. And then Amazon obviously launched A in 2014. And then the war has been on ever since. But I think the expectation from an end user perspective was that by now we would be having continued conversation. I mean, that was a feature Google launched when, like four years ago, this idea that it would know when you wanted to continue speaking, it would wait, it would, it would kind of like anticipate what you're trying to say. You would have something more meaningful than a screaming at it when the alarm goes off to stop and then it not hearing you. And then you basically bang on it and like that's honestly most of my interactions with my Nest Hub Max in my kitchen is that I set a timer, it goes off, I yell at it to stop, it sometimes ignores me, I yell at it louder, and then my daughter goes, Dada, why are you yelling at the screen? And I'm like, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> like, that's basically what, or it's it's my wife and I talking in the living room, and then and it overhears you. Yeah, my, my yeah. Nest Hub going, uh, I don't know how to deal with that, or whatever, and I'm like, shut up. Uh, so... That is the extent to which most people probably interact with their speakers these days. And what's really interesting, we're talking about like how long is it going to take for the OnePlus 9, the OnePlus 8 series to get upgraded to Android 13, like probably well into Q1 2023. uh, I I have OnePlus 10 Pro got stable Android 13 in September, and then 9 got it in November. Really? Yeah. No, they they actually were fast this time. (laughs) Jules, you'll have to cut around this. You're wrong. (laughs) Even though, Will, as we were talking about, it doesn't... And and hacks and and frauds. And I agree that that line... ...history of Microsoft. But chances are, the script was overseen by Microsoft. They probably had a final say in what he could and couldn't say positive or negative about the brand or the products, right? Or he himself, and this is not singling him out necessarily to criticize, but just to say, like, it's a very, very tight balancing act. He probably didn't want to make the client uncomfortable because at the end of the day, they're a client. And the things that you say when you're paid for something, even if they're not necessarily enforcing it, you're going to want to put them in positive light because you want the client to return. So... It is very similar to any client advertiser transaction. And like, that's just something to keep in mind. So there's a lot of really good sponsored content out there. Most sponsored content, however, is not great. And as long as you're disclosing it, it's not a problem. Anyway, it's just interesting that Google got into hot water here, that it happened three years ago and that they're only being fined for it now. A lot of this probably comes down to Lena Khan and the fact that this is a more aggressive FTC than in previous administrations. But yeah, just something to keep in mind there. Okay, let's now pivot and talk a little bit about upcoming Pixel phones. Will, we have our first sort of render that looks legit of the Pixel 7a. Walk us through it. Yeah, so these renders come from, it was it was on leaks in, in collaboration with uh, Smart Pricks. I, ho- I hope I'm saying that right. It's I think it's like, Smart Price. Is it Smart Price? It has an X in it. You don't I know, but French. Yeah, all right. All right, you're Canadian. You you don't <laughs> <laughs> smart price. Um, or priest, right, fine. Or smart. Yeah, yeah. I guess smart priest. I could I could see more than anyway. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So they actually to you know lend some credibility to these. They published early renders of the the Pixel Seven in February, um, and obviously we didn't see that phone until May. Which, if you go back and look. Other than like the color and the, the finish of the band, they're they're correct, right? Like the, notably, the way the camera bar blends into the frame of the phone is there in those like super early renders. So it was really just a walking down the color kind of thing, right? It still has the two tone of the Pixel Six in those renders. They're not one hundred percent accurate, but they give you a good idea of the phones we ended up seeing. With that said, we have renders from them of the the Pixel Seven A. And I know this is not a visual medium podcasting. Um, so what I want you to do is picture the white Pixel Seven in your head. And uh, that's what the renders look like for the for the Pixel 7a. 
just they just you could tell me these are renders of the Pixel Seven, and I believe you. They look identical. We have dimensions coming out of this too. The dimensions are almost identical to the six A, so they are. Oh God, let me get these numbers right. It is uh, the Pixel Seven A. If these dimensions are correct, will be point two millimeters taller, point one millimeters thicker, and one point one millimeters wider than the Pixel Six A. So that is. You, I don't think you'll be able to tell, even if you're holding the phone side by side, it's a Pixel. It's a Pixel phone. Yeah. The dimensions I mean, this are looks... just, just enough different to where you're going to need a different case. Oh, well, obviously. You can't you can't have you reusing accessories. The white, I mean, the, the, the camera bar will also have different dimensions. So Yeah, that's true. I don't think anyone's surprised by this. Like, I, I kind of assumed this is what it would look like, and, and this is kind of our earliest confirmation that this is probably what it'll look like. I think... A slightly smaller, more affordable Pixel 7. Like, I don't think that's a bad thing. I am confused, once this arrives, why you would buy a 7, but that'll be a conversation for a time where we have more concrete details about the 7A. I mean, it does seem like they have pretty much identical specs. Yeah. Uh, 90 hertz refresh rate yep. and wireless charging. The camera will be and different. Like this is, it's sounding like it's basically using the Pixel 6's uh, like camera lineup, but that the Pixel 6 took good photos. So like, yeah. I, I, again, like it's going to be one of those things where it's like, am I going to recommend the regular seven to anybody once this phone, which will be cheaper is on the market? Like probably not, but again, you, you never know. So long as the 7A has the wireless charging, probably not. If the 7A still fails to have wireless charging, then you're going to recommend the Pixel 7 whenever it gets on sale because sure. just like the Pixel 6 going down to like 500 or 50, 400 at uh, primarily access. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, yeah, it all depends on that. It's, it's rumored to have five watt wireless charging, which is pretty slow, but it will be there. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't need the wireless charging to be fast. It just needed to be more fast freaking consistent than literally every pixel before <laughs> i just that part i don't really understand like you're not likely saving any money limiting the charging speed to five watt yeah, other than know. just oh, no, 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 making no. it a it's, point of comparison it's not that it's that the way that google did fast charging is kind of like the same way that samsung and apple did it so it's proprietary and that just means that it takes more time and there are fewer chargers that will work well with it for the actual fast charging so just saying oh this is a five watt charger on the spec sheet allows them to say, okay, we're not getting into any of the high-speed whatever. It's probably the same charging coil that's in the 7. Right, but the latest Qi standard, I think, is is faster than 5 watts. It and is. Every, every single Pixel phone since, what, the Pixel 4, 5, has supported extended power profile, which is 15 watts. So it just doesn't make sense why they would purposefully limit this to 5 watts just to make it slower. I don't think it'll save them any money on the BOM. Is it just but, a, well, we have to differentiate this from the 7? That's what I mean. Yep. It, it sounds exactly that. Like yeah. we're giving the 7A everything the 7 has, except for limiting its wireless charging speed by you know 75%. But that does appear to be the biggest difference. I'm sure the screen will be lower quality compared to the 7. The battery size might be a little bit smaller. The bezels around the screen look a little bit bigger, but overall, like you're getting 95% of the Pixel 7 for 75% of the cost. If they keep so, the price at $450, yeah, I, I just like, like I said, I don't. They can't put it any higher. They like, can, the Pixel well, they 7 is $600. They could go to five. I think they could go to five. I don't think, but yeah, no, when the, the Pixel 7's price really caps them unless, I don't know, unless they hold... No, they wouldn't hold this for the Pixel 8 launch and raise the... No, yeah, they, they, they're they really... If they launch this in the summer, they're really capped at 500, I think. Yeah. I still think that would be too close. That That's a it, matter of, at that point, it just pushes you to the 7 for the faster wireless charging, faster display, and... um Oh, God, what was the third one? And more RAM. Yeah, it's not like Google would be alone in that, though. Like, like Apple's current iPhone lineup is kind of like that, where it's like you can basically make an argument to just keep jumping up $100 as you look at iPhones. The 13 to the 14, I believe, is $100, and, and you don't get that much more for your $100. It would be the same thing with the 7A and the 7. So we'll see. I, I keep waiting for them to raise that $450 price point because inflation and profits and et cetera, et cetera, and... I don't know. I, I think 450 is likely. But, but. Did, I don't think they have any incentive to raise it. Being at 450, 
keeps them in like the upper range, but still a mid range phone. A hundred percent. I yeah, I don't. And think the Pixel, so. like the Pixel A series, has just ruled mid range phones for Android for as long as it's been a thing in North America. I, I yes, also think in we North have America. to we have to keep in mind here that we're looking at pricing from a North American perspective. It's possible they're going to launch the 7A in markets where the 7 didn't launch and make it a bit more competitively priced against the Oppos, Vivos, and Xiaomi's of the world. That might just be a different strategy compared to previous years. Like, we, we really don't know. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, other than that, though, there really isn't much interesting about this other than the fact that we are almost assuredly going to get a really high-quality mid-range device in mid-2023. But that said, like the 6A right now, it was going for $300 most of last week. Yep. I think it's still on sale. I think you can still get it for like 370 which is not, you know, but it, it basically hasn't been at full price in the, in the last like three months. Yeah, but it's been $150 off most of this month. And that's the by far the best deal oh, absolutely. On, a, on a phone yeah. in North America right now. Yeah. So, all right, let's move on. OnePlus is changing its Android phone update strategy. Will, give us the rundown here. Yeah, this is really simple too, just like the the Pixel 7a leak. A year and a half ago, when they were still planning on merging Oxygen OS and ColorOS, they announced that they that move was going to be able to allow them to offer, I, I believe it was three major OS upgrades and four years of security patch support for most of their flagships starting with, I want to say the OnePlus 8. I don't have that article open though. But yeah, for most of their flag, like recent flagships and moving onwards. Today they announced, or as we're recording, they announced that they are moving to four major OS upgrades and five years of security patch support starting next year for select devices. So this does not apply to either of the OnePlus 10 phones. This won't apply to Probably any of the Nords, this will basically be like OnePlus 11 and onward for flagship phones. But that's good news, right? Like it beats Google. It ties Samsung. Google's current support for Pixel 6 and beyond is three OS upgrades, uh, three guaranteed OS upgrades, I should say, and four or uh, five years of security patches. Uh, Samsung's current top tier plan for for like all, you know, S series and, and Z series phones is four and five, just like OnePlus. Where they lose out is like, well, it's one, it's the device support, right? So it's like the OnePlus 11 will be the only phone that falls under this for a while. Then there is timeliness, right? Because like OnePlus has never been quite as fast as, as Google or Samsung. Like I feel like they've gotten better, but they're still not up with those two. And not that they'll ever hit Google speeds, but they're not even at Samsung speeds. And then the third one, and maybe the biggest one, is how often they push out updates. So I confirmed with OnePlus that they're keeping their security patches bi-monthly so that if you get an update in April, the next one will come in June and the next one will come in August and so on. So you're not getting patches every month, no matter what, even on the newest flagship. This is good PR for a company that needs it. <laughs> yes, right. It sure is. This is... It's only good PR if they actually keep to the promise this time. And I'm sorry, but I think no, but that's what I'm saying. Is... obviously the devil yeah. is in the details here. And we are talking about a, a bunch of different things. One is what Will had mentioned about timeliness. Now, <laughs> I totally messed up and I thought that OnePlus was pretty bad about its update speeds. And I said a whole bunch of stuff and we re-recorded it. <laughs> so this is the re-recorded version, uh, mea culpa. <laughs> I really didn't think OnePlus, I hadn't been keeping track, right? I don't use a OnePlus phone very much, so I hadn't been keeping track. But they did great this year. They rolled out OnePlus uh, Android 13 to the OnePlus 10 Pro in... September. They rolled out Android 13 to the OnePlus 9 and OnePlus 8 series earlier this month in November. Uh, so it does seem like they're doing well. That hasn't always been the case. And as Ara pointed out, like Android 13 was not a huge update uh, in terms of like back end, you know, structural changes. That said, like older devices, especially in the Nord series, are not very fast when it comes to updates. So that'll be something that we'll have to keep in mind. And the other part of it, and I don't think anybody's going to disagree here, is that OnePlus updates tend to be buggy. That's really buggy. true. Like that, it, it, and that's been an issue for years now where they'll push out an update and then it, it's like five days later, hey, sorry, guys. Um, turns out it bricked half of the phones that it hit. So we're pausing this for three weeks. And like that's 
a problem, and it's been a recurring problem. Yeah, like, yeah. okay, the first Android 13 ro- update rolled out to these phones pretty quickly, mm-hmm. but when did the update that actually got it right roll out? <laughs> or has it happened yet for some of these? Or like you said, this is such a small update that it's possible that that has been less of an issue over the last two months. It was certainly an issue with Android 12 and, and Oxygen OS 12, and I would expect that Android 14 is a bigger update than Android 13 was, and it's totally possible that this becomes an issue again, like 100%. And I want to give OnePlus the benefit of the doubt here, but the other thing to keep in mind is that Oxygen OS is a very different product than it was two years ago. Right? It's basically color OS. So it aligns with Oppo's update schedule, right? Having a single, very, very large team with a shared code base that's only slightly modifying it for OnePlus means that they can roll things out more quickly. But it also means that if you don't like Oxygen OS today, you're probably not going to like it ever again because it's going to look like color OS for the rest of time. So yeah, that I think on paper, this is fantastic, right? Especially with the fact that we're expecting a OnePlus foldable in 2023. We're expecting the company to kind of take a bit more of a stab at competing with Samsung in the U.S. market, but more than they have been. Rumors are that there's only going to be one OnePlus 11 rather than two, which is interesting. Just called the OnePlus 11 rather than the 11 and the 11 Pro. All of these things kind of reinforce the fact that OnePlus has had a rough couple of years. The OnePlus 9 and OnePlus 10 were okay received, right? I I wouldn't say that they were particularly well received. And I certainly think in terms of like sales, they underwhelmed even OnePlus. So yeah, it's it's really difficult. It's difficult to be a player in the major markets these days. So telling enthusiasts like us that you're going to give four years of platform updates and five years of quarterly security patches, that's a pretty big deal. And I want to give them props for that. Definitely. I do just want to double down. Some of the best OnePlus devices of the last like two years have been the Nord series. It's not been their flagship. So presumably the Nord series will not be included in this. And that's just kind of a bummer because those are good phones for the price. Like we were talking about the, the Pixel 6a and the you know upcoming Pixel 7a. But like the Nord series has like done pretty well, especially as like flagships have faltered. And I would love to see OnePlus adopt this for all of its phones and not a vague select 2023 and beyond device like category. So, you know. And it's interesting too, because OnePlus very quietly launched the N300 5G last month, which is a very cheap and cheerful 5G phone, MediaTek powered. But like we reviewed the predecessor to that, the N200. We reviewed the N10, the N20. We have an Those N300 are- review coming. I <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. Talking to Steven. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Steven has it. So all of these things kind of reinforce the fact that like, I don't know, it's interesting. It's kind of like the A series versus the mainline series for the Pixels or even the A series for, for Samsung versus the S series, right? They sell in higher volume. They're not as good, but they're much more mainstream, much more mass market. And those are the phones that people are going to know OnePlus for, not the flagship 10, 11 Pros. Definitely. So. There's like multiple Nord phones that are like T-Mobile, basically T-Mobile exclusives where like it's like a big partnership with them. And, and you don't see that as much at like the flagship level. I mean, that's because T-Mobile is the only company willing to take a chance on OnePlus. Yeah, prob- yeah. probably, probably rightly. <laughs> that's fa- like famously <laughs> yeah. T-Mobile. Oh, no. I mean, there's a reason that I've never I mean, like I have some OnePlus phones now, but like. I have been a Verizon subscriber since because my family was Verizon subscribers when I got my first phone in middle school. And there was a reason that I never tried the OnePlus One or the OnePlus Two or whatever, any of the OnePlus phones that the early ones that everyone freaked out about was because, well, they were annoying to buy, but more importantly, that they weren't on Verizon and I couldn't use them, you know? Well, the, this Verizon doesn't sell the flagship uh, OnePlus No, no phones, I don't think they ever but have. they're certified. But- now they are, but I took until like the six or the seven to to start working on Verizon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. RIP the One Plus Seven Pro with that like pop up. Oh, camera. the pop up. Yeah. yeah, love it, love it. Still one of the best looking phones ever. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Twitter phone. I just no, I just I don't I don't know if I want I want to stay quiet during this segment. I just want you guys to. to talk oh, I've been about talking it. a lot. I think Not Ara just... should talk about this. <laughs> All righty, Twitter phone. Give us the sort of background story here. 
because there's a lot that like goes into the tweet that ends up with Elon Musk saying, okay, maybe I should build a Twitter phone. But like, what does that actually mean? Well, because Twitter has been deregulating its content moderation a bit and it's become less consistent and It's running a higher risk of getting pulled from the App Store and the Google Play Store because it probably won't meet their standards in six months to a year, maybe even sooner, unless somebody can lock him in a room and put content moderation policies back where they're supposed to be for a major social platform. It's going to be like Parler. Not even like pulling it from Google. Like It's going to reach the point that people can sue them for platforming hate speech. And no app, no app store will want to cover that. And it's all about advertisers not wanting to be on the platform. Yeah. Twitter yeah. saying, like, yeah. Apple is basically holding us ransom. It's, it's just a, a big mess. So the end result is, okay, well, if Google and Apple kick us out, we'll just build our own phone with our own OS and our own app store, and then nobody can stop us. Which is really stupid. Which is for the, like several the reasons. stupidest <laughs> possible answer. To this. It doesn't even make sense. Like, first of all, you don't have to do that to get your app on Android. Like, yep. Epic Games has proved that, right? And so, like, whatever, like, you don't need a specific phone. But also, I don't even remember if we've talked about this in the podcast or not. But it's not like Twitter. Like, Facebook tried to build a phone at its like arguably its height of of maybe not market share, but certainly popularity in the mainstream of, of, of people who would buy a, a Facebook and the phone. phone tanked. And no one bought it. Twitter is loved by a very specific, very uh, sick group of people of which all three of us <laughs> are a member of. I was going to say, bro. <laughs> like, oh, no, like, we're all on the boat. We're all on this boat. But, like, that's not the mainstream, right? Like, my mom's on Facebook. She's not on Twitter. She wouldn't buy a Facebook phone, let alone a Twitter phone. But also, it wouldn't solve the issue. Like, like you don't need hardware. <laughs> like, that's like, it's even beyond that. Like I said, you don't need hardware to offer your app should Apple pull the app from the App Store. It's just beyond dumb. And I've just thought of this, but the Fortnite comparison, no one left iPhone because they couldn't play Fortnite. No one is going to leave their iPhone because they can't download Twitter. It's just yeah. that simple. Well, I think if Apple was the exclusive carrier of Fortnite and yeah. and and... and- it, it was the biggest game in the world, which it is, sure. then maybe that would be the case, but it's not. Oh, and right? you can get Twitter um, on your web browser. Yeah. <laughs> like like on your that's, phone. That's the other thing, too. There have been workarounds yeah. to allow people to use services that are... I mean, we, we make fun of Twitter as like a website, and but essentially it is. It's a website, right? It's not a yeah. game. It's yeah. fairly easy to use. You can load it as a PWA, and it works basically the same as a native app because there's not a whole lot going on but this other thing, too, that, like, I mean, what's relevant to an Android audience is that if Elon Musk ever decided to create its own version of the Freedom Phone or whatever it is, he'd do the same thing that every other scam artist that's launched a, 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 an Android slash, like, a google list Android competitor does, is they take a phone, a white-label version of something that you can buy on Alibaba for 90 bucks, and they load a version of AOSP. Yep on it and they so they quote fortify it with their own security protocols where it's basically running either micro g or an app stack that does not have any google apis doesn't have gms it doesn't have anything to do with google none of the stuff you would want (laughs) limits your ability to do basically anything on an android phone but you know we'll ignore that for a second you would give up youtube to browse twitter like like, come on (laughs) no but youtube has a website I mean, you'd give up basically any native experience. Even Google Maps has a website. Google Docs has a website. But using it on a phone, it's a nightmare. So it's not exactly something you're going to want to do. But more than that, like it ignores the fact that it's going to be running Android. It's not like they're going to ask BlackBerry to license QNX to resurrect (laughs) BlackBerry 10 so that you can create another competitor. It's not like... Elon Musk is going to go to Microsoft and ask them to resurrect Windows Phone on behalf of Twitter users everywhere. Okay, but there but is... hardware is what Elon understands. So it's like, okay, I can't fix no. the software problem here. Let's let's try and attack this from a hardware perspective because that's what I know. And that's just, it's not going to work. Like, it so blatantly isn't going to work. Like, I, I haven't seen anybody at all, anywhere, who said anything other than this is dumb. Like, capital D dumb. 
and, and uh, I have an idea. You guys are missing the bigger picture, which is that Elon can win over so many people back in tech by bringing back WebOS. It's that easy. <laughs> nah. Uh, I mean, that's true because Twitter would run perfectly on a Palm Pre. Palm Pre. Yeah. Or what was the small one? The Pixie? The Pixie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Can you bring Pixie. back those ads too? Oh remember those, remember those weird ads of like, I there was like a woman ads. just staring at you <laughs> like by a palm. <laughs> I was talking at you for like three minutes. <laughs> I was talking with my friend about reincarnation. How come you can't remember your past lives was her ultimate question. Past lives. I left. Before this, I couldn't even keep track of all the ones that I'm living. We should link to that in the show notes Absolutely. just in case people haven't, haven't seen it for a few months or years. Absolutely. I go back to it every couple of years and I'm like, this is the best ad ever. <laughs> I can't um, believe this, this platform was a failure. You two are freaks. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's just, it's, it just, honest, like, obviously, he may have been half serious, but like in the grand scheme of things, he wasn't serious. I think the no. really interesting part about this is. His temper tantrum around being deplatformed from the App Store or the Play Store is all around Apple and Google's 30% cut. It's around Absolutely. the same issues that Epic took when it sued Google and Apple. Apple basically won every tenet of Epic's lawsuit, except for one, where Apple now has to allow for a link inside an app to let you navigate to a web browser to let you go through a purchase process. They are under much more heavy scrutiny in other countries, and they've been forced to allow third-party payment processors in other countries where they haven't in the U.S. But what this is clearly aiming to do is to get Republicans to support. Not running your business on NetSuite is like trying to sink a putt with a cap pulled over your eyes. NetSuite by Oracle gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, budgeting, and more, all in one place. NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade. In his 23 fiscal year, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy had strongly opposed it as part of his bid to become the next Speaker of the House. That decision will come on January 3rd when Republicans take control of the chamber with a slim majority. Severe winter weather continues to disrupt holiday travel. Airlines canceled thousands more flights today. The National Weather Service says the storm was at peak intensity for most of this morning, bringing high winds, record cold, and snow and rain across much of the U.S. Forecasters say those conditions are expected to last through Saturday in much of the central and eastern U.S. More than 200 million people are under some type of winter weather warning. The Internal Revenue Service is delaying a tax filing rule for gig workers, giving millions of Americans a one-year reprieve. The law would require e-commerce platforms like eBay, Etsy, and Airbnb to give the IRS information on users with more than $600 in revenue. Acting IRS Commissioner Doug O'Donnell says the delay will give taxpayers more time to prepare and help avoid confusion during the 2023 tax filing season. The U.S. economy is showing more signs of slowing down. The Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, rose 5.5% in November, a notable cooling from October's 6.1%. The data is the latest indication that inflation is easing from its summer highs. The Department of Justice says it's been putting more resources into cracking down on crypto crimes, and it plans to do even more. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco spoke to the Wall Street Journal. What we have established is a network of prosecutors around the country who are subject matter experts who've raised already over the last year the level of the department's expertise to investigate and bring these cases. My colleague Aruna Vishwanatha spoke to Monaco, who says the DOJ strategy appears to have sped up the case against the founder of collapsed crypto exchange FTX. So I think for Sam Bankman-Fried, the investments by the Justice Department clearly paid off to some extent and helped them bring this case, but also they were given a lot of evidence from the company itself, from his top lieutenants who are pleading guilty within a matter of weeks. For the industry more broadly, these investments by the Justice Department also potentially foreshadow a tougher road. Bankman Freed faces charges of fraud and conspiracy. He was extradited to the U.S. from the Bahamas this week and released on a $250 million bond.
Meanwhile, two of his associates, Caroline Ellison and Gary Wang, have pleaded guilty to fraud and other offenses and are cooperating with federal prosecutors. Ellison apologized in court this week, telling a judge that she and others conspired to steal billions of dollars from FTX customers. That's according to a transcript of the hearing made available today. Coming up, after an 18-month investigation, the work of the January 6th committee has come to an end. What we learned from the panel's final report after the break. Sweet. For the new year, NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash Wall Street. As we reported in this morning's show, the House panel investigating the January 6th, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol released its final report late last night. The more than 800-page report summarizes the panel's findings after an 18-month investigation. Chief among them, that former President Donald Trump disseminated false allegations of fraud related to the 2020 election, provoking supporters to violence. The report comes after the committee voted on Monday to refer Trump to the Justice Department for four potential criminal charges, including incitement of an insurrection. Trump rejected the report in a post on his Truth Social platform on Thursday, saying it purposely fails to, quote, study the reason for the protest, unquote, which he again flagged as election fraud. That's despite findings by authorities, including his former Attorney General William Barr, that the Justice Department found no evidence of widespread voter fraud. So after a year and a half, where does that leave us? Our team has been poring over the committee's report, and joining me now with some key takeaways is Wall Street Journal investigative reporter Scott Patterson. Scott, thanks so much for being here after such a long night. Thanks for having me. So, Scott, start by telling us what new information we learned from this report beyond all we've seen and heard from this year's hearings. What stood out to you, and tell us your major impressions here. You know, so far, we haven't been able to find any big bombshells that we didn't know about before. It doesn't really get that much into the security lapses, for instance, and in some ways absolves the security apparatus of failing to protect the Capitol that day. Because the report says security officials could never have imagined that a president would direct a mob, an armed mob, towards the Capitol. But but there's just a lot of new information and details around the edges of this multi-part plot by Donald Trump and his allies to reverse the results of the 2020 election. By and large, this whole thing is a vast 845-page indictment of the former president. I was looking into a chapter in the report that focuses on the plan to get these fake electors organized in seven states that Mr. Trump had lost to Joe Biden. It really sort of spells out in a linear narrative how this whole thing came about, who organized it, who was emailing who, who in the Trump orbit was signing on to it, and how it went forward and and sort of became the central piece of Mr. Trump's efforts on January 6th to get his vice president, Mike Pence, to take some kind of action that would reverse the results of the election. Scott, this report also issues recommendations. Can you talk about some of the big ones? Yeah, so one of them is a pretty big one, recommending that using the 14th Amendment, Congress should take some action to keep Mr. Trump from ever holding office again. The 14th Amendment bans somebody who supported an insurrection against the United States from holding office. It was enacted following the Civil War to keep some of the Confederates from holding office again in Congress. As far as I know, it's never been invoked since then. It's not likely to happen. (laughs) For one thing, the House is turning over to the Republicans in January. It's sort of symbolic, uh, you know, and interesting, and it has credibility, but it's not likely to happen anytime soon. Bigger picture, Scott, uh, this was a highly politicized process, and this report caps 18 months of investigations into the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Where does this all leave us now? Well, the uh, the January 6th committee with the new Congress is going to you know, sort of turn into Cinderella's pumpkin and vanish. <laughs> committee members might, on their own, uh, continue to pursue some of the recommendations that they made in the report you know, including more oversight of extremist groups, changes in election laws that could keep something like this from happening again. But where the story really goes now is 
the baton is being passed to the Justice Department. Uh, and we know there's a special counsel who's been named, who's been pursuing, for one thing, the fake elector plot. He's been sending subpoenas to people in various states who were associated with that plot. One interesting thing to keep an eye on are the criminal referrals that the committee made on Monday to the Justice Department. It means that it's not going to be a political issue for the Justice Department now because they operate separately from Congress. Whether they take action or whether this report informs their own investigation remains to be seen, but it'll be interesting to follow what happens with those referrals. You know, when when I talk to people who really know what the DOJ is, how they operate, there's a lot of skepticism that the committee is going to be providing information that they don't already have. There's no question that at some point the committee was ahead of the Justice Department, but the thinking now is that the committee has provided a good narrative that can sort of help the Justice Department explain what they're doing. But in terms of the nuts and bolts of an investigation and the information that the Justice Department has, it's unlikely that there's much here that they don't have. I've been speaking with Wall Street Journal investigative reporter Scott Patterson. Scott, thank you so much for your insight here. Yeah, thanks for having me. One company either. It's not just Google screwing up the software on the Pixel 6. It's not just Fitbit with the Versa 4 and the Sense 2. It's not just at, like it's everybody. Is, it, these companies are just adding their pockets more and taking away from the users. And it's just frustrating being somebody in this space, this industry. Yeah, yeah. Re- releasing a product before all the features were ready gives the same result as releasing a product that was fundamentally broken. Yeah. Uh, you know, eSIM for the iPhone is a good example. This is another good example. Another uh, good example is Apple... Apple, in a course of 24 hours or 48 hours, reversing course on adding yeah. gambling ads to the App Store yeah, they, they, because they, they didn't I, think it all the way through. The idea sounded great when they were talking about how much money they can make. Right. But in the end, it doesn't matter the reason why. It was just a dumb move. And it's good to remind everybody that these companies do stupid things because they're greedy. Yeah, so speaking of greedy companies, let's talk about another review that... um, (laughs) (laughs) Good good segue. Good segue. segue. Let's talk about another company that's very greedy uh, and uh, and are putting out products that are, you know, freaking expensive. Uh, MetaQuest Pro Review. (laughs) The Oculus Quest grew up and uh, got a job. Uh, Nick, you did the uh, review for the latest... um, MetaQuest Pro are, uh, that just released uh, $14.99. Who has that kind of money? I don't even know, but okay. Uh, so you gave it a 4.5 stars out 3. of 5. 3.5, <laughs> sorry, 3.5 stars out of 5. Uh, another not-so-glowing review. Uh, okay, l- l- before we get into this, let's let's um, make it very clear to our listeners who may not be fully aware. This specific product is geared for enterprise companies. So, you know, companies that are dealing with productivity, companies who who want to work in the metaverse, which I don't even know which company is working in the metaverse right now. Facebook. (laughs) Facebook, (laughs) sure. Facebook, sure. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, you did, you know, you did have some good stuff to say about it, but you also had a lot of not so good stuff to say. Uh, let's talk about it. What what were your thoughts about this, Nick? All right, let, let's go hardware first, because that's easily the most positive part of this whole thing, right? Like this, the hardware is freaking blissful, okay? Like as far as VR headsets go, this thing is elegant. It's beautiful. The hardware team did an absolutely bang-up job. The only part that they, I guess, royally screwed up on was the battery part, right? So... While this thing is way more comfortable, it's way lighter and smaller, it looks good, it feels really well built, unlike, well, the Quest 2 feels kind of cheap, right? This does not at all. Um, The battery life's two hours. And and I know they told me that at the hands-on, and I already had, like, you know, red lights going off, right? Like, yeah, okay, that's going to be a problem. But 
as a consumer, and I have to come from that angle because that's what I am. I'm not an enterprise. I, I don't have those functions, right? So from a consumer level, it's very obvious why they're not uh, marketing this toward consumers. And I think the, the ironic thing is there is a relatively simple fix for this. They could have made the battery modular. Um, one of our favorite Quest 2 head straps is one from a company called Bobo VR. And they kind of came out of nowhere, I think about a year ago. And they have a little like magnetic battery that pops right into the, the back of their head strap for the Quest 2. And it makes a nice beep when it connects. Like you can pop it off and put a new one in while you're playing. Like it's freaking ingenious, right? Okay, they've had this around for a year, maybe a year and a half. I can't remember the exact time frame. But knowing that, I'm kind of like, this seems like such an obvious thing to put in uh, a pro-level headset or an enterprise-level headset where, you know, your users are probably going to be wearing this for longer than somebody who's just playing a game for an hour. Yeah. I, I disagree. I, I, I read this review, and, you know, I'm going to do something crazy for me, and I'm going to give meta props for this. This looks like it was designed from the ground up as a as a piece of enterprise equipment. Uh, OSHA is not going to let you wear a VR headset for more than two hours. So, you know, That's the two-hour battery life is probably fine. Uh, you, I know, when everybody thinks enterprise, the first thing you think of is a bank. J.P. Morgan Chase, you can see everybody using a headset to do banking. No. No. This is going to be used... In industry, factory floors, chemical plants, uh, R and D work. This this kind of stuff, VR lends itself really well to. You can simulate things in VR and do them without causing an explosion that kills people. Right. That's a great use for use case for VR. But you can't strap somebody in a headset and leave them there eight hours a day. OSHA is not going to let them have it. There's going to be a time limit. And during that time, it's going to be very important that the screen is really good and it's very comfortable and that the product itself is durable. Because when you take it off after your time with the VR headset is over, you set it on a shelf somewhere, it's going to get knocked on the ground. It's going to get, you know, dust or it's going to get messed up a right. lot more than one you keep in your, you know, bedroom at home. So I think Facebook was smart. And design this as a, a piece of industry proof, you know, industrial grade equipment. That's, that's a good point to make about that. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention so, Nick, in your uh, review, you mentioned the N Real Air, and you actually reviewed uh, this pair of smart glasses a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago. I can't remember when you did it. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, but uh, again, also a fantastic review. Um, it it was it made me want to get the Enreal Air because I was just like, oh my god, this is like the coolest pair of smart glasses ever. Um, and you said that it basically works similar to the Quest Pro in a way that it can hook up to other devices and display virtual monitors in front of your face through the lens of the glasses. But you still say that while it's more comfortable long term, you may feel more and you also might feel more socially accepted wearing these glasses over any other VR headset in public, the Quest Pro was far, far more comfortable to use uh, than even that tiny pair of glasses are, um, which, again, kind of goes to, to what Jerry was saying about comfort and and making it, a, a you know, certain durability. Um, but I'm actually curious. So when you wear it, like, how heavy does it feel? It does not feel heavy, and that's... I think that was one of the most surprising things to me because, okay, so back on a month ago when I did the hands-on, right, when I was in New York for this, they gave it to me. I didn't read any spec lists or anything like that. I had no idea what the headset weighed, right? I put it on my head, and I was like, dang, they really reduced the weight of this thing. Like, I can't <laughs> believe how much lighter it is. And then a week later, when they finally sent out the spec list, I was like, wait, is 50 grams heavier than the Quest 2? Wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I had, I literally had no idea it was heavier until, you know, a week later when I got that. And I was like, man, it is amazing what just designing a better head strap can do for something that is the same or heavier of a weight. 
And, you know, part of that also goes into it's a lot thinner. Um, you have that opening around your eyes. Like you can see in your peripheral vision, you can see your feet, you can see your arms. Like a lot of these. Today on the Vergecast, James Finn. This person's <laughs> talking about porn with GPT and I'm, I'm here with them. I mean, if you guys aren't any capture lately, we, we, you know, we, this is already part of our day to day lives. Yeah, yeah. sure. We've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> this is a fire hydrant. Um, so we should let you go, yes. James. We should call out. James has his own very good book called Beyond Measure, which is a delight. Oh, Soon you. to be excerpted at The Verge when it comes out in the United States. Tell us about your book, James. Oh, uh, it is um, a history of measurement. Uh, it is a sort of, you know, it's a history, it's a science book, it's a sociology book. It's where, does, where do measurements come from, uh, what do people do with them, and why do Americans hate the metric system so much? Those are the three big questions <laughs> I tackle. <laughs> it's very good. It's very funny. I bought, I bought, I have a British copy because I'm fancy. Oh, dear. I bought, I bought it early. I see. I bought an import. Nice. Yeah. Like I, do, like I used to do a seven inches. I bought an import copy. <laughs> You know, the U.S. version has a bonus edition of Train in Vain at the very end. It's not labeled. <laughs> uh, all right, we've gone on too long. James, thank you so much. Always a pleasure, man. Oh, my pleasure. So nice to step in. And, uh, yeah, I'll speak to you guys later. Bye-bye. All right, we'll be right back. we got to talk about, well, we got to talk about Apple. Elon. There's all kinds of stuff. We'll be right back. You know, when you're staying at an Airbnb, it might have crossed your mind. Could my place be an Airbnb? And if it could, what could it earn? That's something that Gil in St. Louis thought, too. Don't worry about getting caught watering the lawn in the rain. With the Moen Smart Water Net. There's some candy crush. Oh, Phil Spencer, to us, to me, has said many times, we're going to put Call of Duty on PlayStation as long as there's a Call of Duty. Then there was this, like, side light conspiracy theory, which was honestly my favorite conspiracy <laughs> theory, that they would only do Call of Duty on PlayStation as, like, an Xbox Game Pass streaming situation. I love so it. So Sony would be forced to Trojan horse the Game Pass streaming app on the PlayStation yeah, you so you could stream Call it. of Duty. So I asked him about that. He got all riled up. He was like, no, native code. <laughs> and I was like, how long is the deal? Initially, they'd only offered three years. And Phil told me, like, you can't write a contract forever, which is true. You're right. Like, I, this is not legal advice. This is not a legal show. If you're listing the show without your lawyer, you're making a mistake. <laughs> like, please, please drive immediately to the nearest lawyer's office to continue listening to the show. Uh, I'll just ask chat B GPT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Should you sign a contract whose term is forever? And I feel like very clearly the answer is no. Even chat GPT will be like, don't no, do that. Don't do that. Like, no contracts are forever. So fine, I get it. So then... Microsoft has been running around these past few weeks trying to appease regulators in this country and in Europe mm -hmm. by saying, okay, we will commit to Call of Duty for 10 years. Okay. Which is an awful long time. Yeah. Like, they're going to be out of major world conflicts to mine, and they will be <laughs> fully in the future. <laughs> they're already in the future. Yeah, they have, like, like, they they're going to have to get rid of, like, like, all the World War II Call of Duties are done for. Yeah, they're done. They, they went to the future, and they went back already. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, Call of Duty is like they're just gonna be out of wars or like whatever. AI Call of Duty is where we're at. Ten years now, that was not good enough. It was not good enough for the CMA in Europe, which has already said we're gonna stop it. We're starting an investigation, and then here, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, has basically been rumbling at this for a long time. Yeah, just muttering to itself, just like we. And I don't know if this happened. So when I say there's some like there's a little bit of interest. Yeah. They filed the suit, the lawsuit. Okay. We have not seen the complaint yet. The word on the street is they're not going to release it until Microsoft has, like, gotten it. <laughs> until Microsoft President Brad Smith has, like, sat down with a snifter of yeah. brandy and, like, read the complaint. <laughs> um, his little smoking jacket on. But today, the day they said they're going to do this complaint. Oh, um, they also filed the complaint in their own administrative court, not in federal court. Okay. Which is, like, tactically interesting. Like, yeah. what do they actually want out of this? Do they actually want to block the deal or just a lot of bluster to get some concession? Who knows? But today, the same day, is the first day of the trial where the FTC is has sued to stop Meta, Facebook, mm -hmm. from buying Within, which makes Supernatural, which I have called the killer app for VR. It's it's pretty killer. It's very good. So if you have a Quest 2, uh, Supernatural is a fitness app. You like 
It's Beat Saber, but you have to, like, sweat. It's Beat Saber Peloton. Oh, yeah. they've added kicking. They added kicking? Yeah, knee strikes. All right, well, and I got... also boxing. I got some... The boxing is great. Boxing's I like the boxing. Great. I think I told the story in the virtual before. My wife did the boxing in Supernatural one time, grinned the whole time, then took off the headset and said, I'm great at boxing. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what you want, right? So this, this thing's great. It sells a lot of headsets. Uh, Chris Milk, the CEO of Within, has been on Decoder. He's like... Super, the supernatural community is like 50 50 men and women, and it's people over 40, which is not a traditional VR right. user base. Like, this is a thing, this app initiates people into buying a Quest 2 because it's good. So, Meta said, screw it. We're, we buy every other VR game. We're going to buy Supernatural. They went and bought it. FTC sued them. This deal is like teeny tiny. They're buying this thing for like 20 bucks. Yeah. And it's an app for VR headsets. Yeah. A market size of six. <laughs> like, they're the biggest fish in a tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny pond. If the FCC is going to block that deal, they basically had no choice but to block to block the Activision deal. It's like right, obviously, console gaming is much bigger. Activision itself is much bigger. Microsoft very opportunistically swept in because Bobby Kotick to Activision is like. I mean, uh, Activision um, Blizzard has been facing some bad times for right, us. They've, like numerous uh, allegations of like weird sexual misconduct across the company. Yep, a lot of people have been let go for for misconduct. There's a lot of union organizing happening because of the misconduct. Yeah. I would not want to work there right now. It seems really busy. Yeah, it seems and, unpleasant. But, and so Microsoft very openly, like after this first wave of allegations, they just like showed up and they're like, "Wouldn't it be great if you didn't run this company anymore? Yeah, just give it to us. Give it to us." And so, like, there's just a lot of noise. So if you're gonna, if you are the FTC and you have to, and you have sued to block Meta from buying Supernatural, and by the way, that complaint, you know, I'm anti. I think murders are bad, but the complaint, the FTC's complaint in that is like, we tr- we've tried Supernatural. It's a very good. <laughs> <laughs> like, you shouldn't have it, right? Um, if you buy Supernatural, you will not turn Beat Saber into a proper competitor for Supernatural. And I think rightfully, Meta. The Beat Saber team were like, what are you talking about? Like, in what world is Beat Saber turning into a, a Peloton? Yeah. Like, no, that's like, what? In the world of the FTC where they want Beat they, Saber. They have to find some reason. So they, they filed this. We have not read it. They filed it in this administrative court. They have said to Axios, or someone has said to Axios, they are not asking to actually, like, block the deal at this time. So mm-hmm. the deal might still close. So they've sued to block the deal. So it shouldn't happen. But they've not asked their own administrative court to be like, "Yeah, don't let them do it. So I, and there's a little nuance in there that I, uh, without having read the complaint, that I can't quite tell you about. And the complaint's not out yet. But you just get the sense that like the Europeans are definitely on firmer ground when it comes to blocking mergers. That's like what they're good at. Yeah. <laughs> and the FCC is like, we're also finally suit. And maybe what we want is some intensely hardcore concessions. And this is like calibrated to achieve that result while they go fight this other battle around supernatural in court where they, well, you know, Lena Khan starts to prove her theory. Cause the supernatural, that's not in the administrative law court. That's in, that's in court, court, court. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's other cases against Facebook and others uh, that she has filed. She's the chairwoman of the FCC. She's got novel theories about competition. And I, again, completely honest, like I agree with most of her theories, the courts in this country are like, that's new. New ideas, you say. No, thank you. They don't right? understand what a phone is. <laughs> They're deeply confused about how some of this technology works. And in particular, like, network effects and like how you might lock people in. So, And we're seeing this with Apple and Epic, right? Mm-hmm. Like, There's just some baseline confusion about what creates lock-in for a consumer yeah. or where anti-competitive in these markets might come from. And then there's the real problem, and this is particularly true in Apple and Epic and some of these other cases, where the our country in particular, for about 40 years, has been like, mergers, great. Love a merger. Love a merger. Bigger you want to buy than some better. shit, you should buy some shit. Yeah. Right? And so you've got to just overcome a lot of precedent to, to block a merger. So I, I just see, like, I see where this case is calibrated, mm-hmm. and I see that the Europeans want to block it too. And what we'll just see... I don't know, do you think it's a good idea? Like, you know, Microsoft is like running out there. And again, you should listen to the conversation I had with, with Phil about it on Decoder. He made his case. Yeah. Right? And it's very funny when a big company wants to buy something. The case is always, but we suck. 
Yeah, we suck so much. Let us buy this. So this market is so better. competitive. We've been getting it's our hard. ass kicked. We're nowhere in mobile games. We need to buy Candy Crush. Yeah. Call of Duty, you could have Call of Duty. The future is mobile, right? Like, go listen to it. It's Bill is very good. The man was born to be the CEO of Microsoft. <laughs> He's very, very good at that job. Um, uh, you know, and he's a, a candid executive. So you can go listen to it. But the argument basically boils down to if we don't grow, we die. And all the growth is in mobile. So we have to buy Activision so we can get mobile games. Yeah. And all the stuff we're talking about with our consoles is like kind of a sidelight. Do Which you is, buy it? I mean, I don't because that's not their biggest market, right? Like Xbox is certainly a big part of Microsoft, but... Cloud computing is a much bigger part of Microsoft. Yeah. And so so for them to say this, it's just like super disingenuous because like, yeah, they're a gaming company, but they're a cloud company first and foremost, even more so than, than they're an operating system company or any of these other things. Like they do cloud computing. So to say this is just like some bullshit. <laughs> well, I feel see, like. I mean, I, I honestly don't know where this is going to go. Like. This is a this is a big case. This is a generationally important antitrust case. Yeah, because there's we just have not stopped deals like this as well, a country. I thought it was kind of interesting that we've seen Microsoft go on this spree around the same time that we also saw like one of the biggest kind of halts in vertical integration in the entertainment community go away, which was the Paramount decree that was like from the 30s that they they got rid of a couple of years ago, and that Paramount decree said. If you are making the movies, you cannot own the theaters because that's really hinky because then you get to control where your movies screen. Yeah. And the exact like we're dealing with that issue in streaming and we're dealing with it in gaming. If if Microsoft is making the game consoles, they probably shouldn't also be making the games because then they control where those games go. And like it's fundamentally the same thing. But I know that our country has said, yeah, consent Paramount's consent decree, don't need it. We're fine. Yeah. We well, so to, to abstract that out, it's, it's usually like, you know, vertical versus horizontal mergers, right. right? And so we allow vertical ones, or we have for the past 40 years, which is the theaters were the only distribution. Yeah. And if you own all the distribution, you have a lot of power over the, the studios. And so the studios shouldn't own the theaters because then the other studios, they can unfairly right. discriminate. Disney can say you will never see another MGM movie in our theaters again. And we own all the theaters. So they're like, no, you can't do that. The theaters have to be competitive. You can, like, apply that lesson to the iOS app store. Yeah. You can apply that lesson to Comcast. Like, whatever it is. Like, whoever owns the pipes or the distribution. Here, I think you're saying, like, the game consoles are they're like the distribution. Yeah, the game consoles are the theater, right? Right. Like, and, and they have a very robust big business there. If they're making the theaters, they probably shouldn't also be making the content that goes into those theaters. In this case, all of the games at Activision Blizzard, one of the largest gaming companies not currently owned by Microsoft, like yeah. or Nintendo existing. One thing that makes it a little more complicated is that generally the consoles are sold at a loss. They're not necessarily profiting on the actual consoles themselves. The because they're profiting the on those this analogy. They're, the they're making sales. a profit on the games. And I guess Microsoft is claiming that they would love to make more money from games. So of course they'll sell Call of Duty on <laughs> PlayStation or Nintendo or Steam because everyone wants to play Call of Duty on Switch. That's that's what you want. Yes. Yeah. By the way, Nintendo happily took the ten-year deal for Call of Duty. Yeah. No complaints filed. No. No letters think- to the senators. They were like, ten years of Call of Duty on the Switch. We'll take it because they don't give a did shit. They, did they? Did that specify what kind of Call of Duty? Like, is it just going to be the mobile gross version that's on your phone? I don't think it matters to, to Nintendo. I think Nintendo, Nintendo knows doesn't care. That anybody who owns a console also probably wants to play Mario. Yeah, and they've got an absolute rock solid, legally defensible monopoly on <laughs> Mario, and he's never going anywhere except Nintendo consoles. It is very funny that we're like, oh, I don't know if 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 Microsoft can own Call of Duty. And Nintendo is like, we own everything on our platform, and we <laughs> will that's destroy. Their model. I mean, they're, yeah. they're the Apple of this industry, and Microsoft is the yeah. uh, Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> but what I want to know is, what kind of concessions could the FTC get? And, and I'm very specific about my needs. I need to be able to use controllers across across platforms. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like buying like multiple controllers. I don't need dual. Sen- I don't want to use dual sense. I just want to use my Xbox Elite controller everywhere. So we need to fix that. Lena, yeah. Khan, Lena, if you're listening, <laughs> step I need one. to be able to use my game.
Atlas is preparing several new game announcements for 2023 Nintendo Life. Atlas is preparing several new game announcements for 2023. The year will start with the releases of P3P and P4G. In the same Famitsu article, the Persona developer Atlas has taken the time to thank fans for their support last year. It has also provided a teaser of what's ahead for 2023. After the release of titles like Persona 5 Royal and 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rimmon 2022, the company will look towards the remastered releases of Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden. In addition to this, it apparently has several new unannounced titles in the making via Persona Central. Happy New Year! Thank you very much for your support and patronage for the remastered version of P4U2 in 2022. The Nintendo Switch version of 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim Soul Hackers 2, and the remastered version of Persona 5 Royal. Thanks to your support, the remastered edition of P5R achieved 1 million sales within one month of its release, and P5R as a whole has surpassed 3,300,000 units worldwide. In 2023, we will start with the remastered releases of P3P and P4G, and we are also preparing several new unannounced titles. Please look forward to it. Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden were previously locked for an early 2023 release in October last year. They'll both be arriving on the Switch later this month on 19th January, so be on the lookout for our Nintendo Life reviews. Apart from these games, what else would you like to see from Atlas in 2023? Tell us down below. SourceFamitsu.com, ViperSnaceandTroll.com Related Games Persona 3 Portable Switch eShop, Persona 4 Golden Switch eShop. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Former playtester to receive settlement payment from Nintendo hiring agency Nintendo Life. Update 13th Opt, 2022 to 2000 Beast Nintendo of America and Clifton have both shared statements with Axia Celia today. Nintendo of America has said that it is thankful that a resolution was reached and that it would be making sure that the company's work environment remains welcoming and supportive for all employees. It also added that it wants employees and workers not to disclose Nintendo's confidential business information and trade secrets. Clifton tells Axios their goal behind the charge was to show my co-workers that know what their rights are and what happens when they choose to exercise them, and that the terms of the settlement are exactly what I hope to see. Original article 13th Opt, 2022 to 5 Beast following on from former playtester Mackenzie Clifton's recent account of their dismissal. Recruitment firm Aston Carter has agreed to pay the fired Nintendo contractor a settlement of $25,910. Senior reporter at Kotaku Ethan Gok shared the update in Twitter earlier today. Clifton filed a complaint against the recruitment agency and Nintendo of America back in April, accusing the companies of union-busting tactics. 
the settlement agreement, which is public viewable and available to download here, specifies the damages fee from Aston Carter and also stipulates that Nintendo of America will have to post notice in its offices and email a copy of the notice in English to employees. The notice will make explicit to Nintendo of America employees that they have the right to form a union and that Clifton who Nintendo previously claimed was fired over an ender breach, will be made whole pick. Twitter.com slash ZVWF3 Oc VPR American Truck Songs 9 at Ethan Jock October 13, 2022 The notice addresses workers' rights in North America and states that all employees have the right to join, form, assist, or support a union, and pick a representative. Clifton's recent account claimed that the tester asked NOAA President Doug Bowser about unionization in the games industry during an online meeting with many other playtesters, which was not answered directly. The company has been criticized a number of times this year for its treatment of contracted and part-time workers. As this is a sensitive topic, please keep our community rules in mind when discussing it below. Source for EA and Lenny. Apple reports another record quarter but shows signs of lukewarm iPhone 14 demand The Verge. Apple reported its fiscal fourth quarter earnings in Thursday, tallying $90.1 billion in revenue and earnings per share of $1.29, both above Wall Street. Expectations in a period when other tech giants aren't faring so well. Practically all of Apple's divisions, including iPhone, Mac, services, and wearables, were up year over year, with the exception of the iPad. But despite yo growth, iPhone revenue came in beneath estimates. There's been conjecture among analysts and other reports that the iPhone 14 and iPhone 14 Plus are underperforming Apple's expectations for the regular lineup, with most upgraders favoring the 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. The Pro phones include a faster processor, upgraded camera system, and the new Dynamic Island interface. The quarter only included eight days' worth of iPhone 14, 14 Pro, and 14 Pro Max sales. The larger Plus version wasn't released until several weeks later. Supply is constrained for the iPhone 14 Pro models and new Apple Watch Ultra, CFO Luca Maestri told the Wall Street Journal. We clearly countered the industry trends on the phone if you look at third-party estimates of what the smartphone industry did, CEO Tim Cook told CNBC. He also reiterated that Apple is being deliberate in its hiring and is thus slowing down its pace of bringing on new employees. Apple's services division was up year over year, but only by single digits. The company just raised subscription prices for Apple Music, Apple TV Plus, and its Apple One bundle, so that might give upcoming quarters a boost after this slowdown. The monthly price of Apple Music only went up by a dollar, but it marked an end to the long standing $9.99 slash month rate for streaming music. Competitors like Spotify and Amazon Music might soon follow suit. Apple's fiscal fourth quarter saw the introduction of numerous products, including a completely redesigned MacBook Air along with a refreshed iPhone lineup, iPhone 14, 14 Plus, 14 Pro, and 14 Pro Max and new Apple Watch models, including the Apple Watch Ultra, Apple Watch Series 8, and Apple Watch SE. The company also launched a second-generation pair of the AirPods Pro. On the software side, Apple rolled out iOS 16 and WatchOS 9 during the quarter, but waited until this week to release iPodOS 16.1 and MacOS Ventura. The iPad software's new stage manager feature has been met with criticism. After announcing new iPads earlier this month, Apple is expected to release upgraded 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros in the coming weeks.
Tesla announces date for 2023 Investor Day Tesla Investor Relations Tesla announces date for 2023 Investor Day Business Wire January 2, 2023. We plan to host Tesla's 2023 Investor Day on March 1, 2023. The event will be live streamed from our Gigafactory, Texas, with the option for some of our institutional and retail investors to attend in person. Details to follow. Our investors will be able to see our most advanced production line as well as discuss long term expansion plans, Generation 3 platform capital allocation and other subjects with our leadership team. For additional information, please visit tts colon slash slash er .com. Investor Relations Contact, er at tesla.com. Stop filming strangers in 2023 The Verge. In my favorite TikTok video of 2022, an amateur interviewer with a tiny microphone approaches a stranger in an AC slash DC t-shirt minding their own business. Pushing the mic in front of the person's face, the interviewer comes in with the favorite question of gatekeepers from time immemorial. Can you name three AC slash DC songs? Wordlessly, without hesitation, the person in the AC slash DC shirt glances down at the mic back up at the interviewer, and swats away his hand, like how you add shoe away a fly near your food. It is beautiful, amazing, perfect, and, if we're all so lucky, will hopefully become way more normalized in the future. The video is from an account that peddles these person on their street sound bites, which is just one flavor in a genre of video that derives its entertainment value from unwitting passersby. The person filming might come up with the concept, but the most interesting parts of the videos are the subjects who are knowingly or unknowingly roped in. TikTok's For You page has probably served you up a version of this kind of thing. The world first met Corn Kid, one of the cutest viral sensations of the year, when he was interviewed for a casual internet show called Recess Therapy, where a host talks off their cuff with kids out and about in New York. There are shows that ask people trivia questions in exchange for money. The astrology app CoStar shares clips of conversations with ordinary people and tries to guess their zodiac sign. Fashion vloggers stop the best dressed and ask where every article of clothing is from. But often, people are featured in videos having never signed up for it in the first place. In a clip that's been viewed more than 20 million times, two friends sit on a New York City stoop, observing and recording the people walking by. One person appears to bend down to hide from a passing emergency vehicle, looking genuinely concerned. Another stands near motionless for a time, seemingly unable to move. It's unclear if they're having a medical issue, but the clip is presented as amusing. The intention is to stitch together a tapestry of things the creator considers odd. Instead, it ends up feeling like an unnecessary intrusion into a stranger's walk home. Many viewers on TikTok ate it up, but others pushed back on the idea that there's humor in filming and posting an unsuspecting neighbor for content. This year, I saw more and more resistance to the practice that's become normal or even expected. One type of video that tends to go mega viral is the random acts of kindness variety, in which a man it's always a man will film themselves doing something nice for a stranger and show the audience the person's reaction. The people who are blessed with kindness are often presented as a person in need a mom shopping at Walmart, a person asking for spare change, or simply someone sitting alone in a public space. It's unnerving and weird to be filmed by others. After being the subject of one of these viral TikToks, a woman from Melbourne told news outlets in July that she felt dehumanized after being commodified for cheap content. The implication being that any older woman should be thrilled to get even a crumb of attention. If you approach me while I am sitting alone, thinking my thoughts, hoping to use me to manufacture sympathy and followers, I, too, would go to the media and complain. Other people who have been featured in videos unbeknownst to them have pointed out that even if there's no ill will, it's just unnerving and weird to be filmed by others as if you're the characters in the story of their life. One TikTok user, at Hill Mathglin, landed in a stranger's vlog when they filmed her to show her outfit. She didn't realize it had happened until another stranger recognized her and tagged her in the video. It's weird at best, and creepy and a safety hazard, at worst she says in a video.
The man on their street genre is a well-worn format before Billy Eichner was writing and starring in movies, he was bothering normal, unsuspecting people of the la land. Journalists have long used the form to get first-hand accounts and opinions for news hits. In the case of more professional operations, there's likely at least some level of getting permission, whether that's having subjects sign release forms or identifying clearly who's filming and why. In the case of random TikTok creators, it's clear the level of consent and notice Samsung's Viewfinity S9 is a stylish 5K display for creative professionals The Verge. Samsung's 2023 monitor plans don't just include Odyssey gaming screens and a new version of its smart monitor, the company is also directly coming after Apple, an LG with a 27-inch, color-accurate 5K monitor called the Viewfinity S9. Samsung says the 5120 x 2880 IPS display has a matte finish to reduce glare and covers 99% of the DCheap 3 wide color gamut. The Viewfinity S9 will support a wide mix of i/O including HDMI, Thunderbolt 4, USB and DisplayPort. It can charge laptops at up to 96 watts. The S9's sleek design and metal enclosure are in keeping with the Bull Studio display and LG's higher-end OLED monitors. Unfortunately, I couldn't get an answer at press time as to whether Samsung's latest monitor includes local dimming. I'm guessing if it did, they would be highlighting that feature. So black levels and overall contrast might not fully measure up to mini LED and OLED screens. Samsung does claim that its HDR600 further improves image shadow and highlight details however, even though this monitor is geared towards prosumers that hasn't stopped Samsung from building its Tizen TV OS into the Viewfinity S9, so you will be able to access all the usual streaming apps even when the display isn't connected to any external devices. It ships with a slim 4K webcam in the box that you can attach as needed for video calls. And Samsung says the software will automatically zoom and intelligently track the subject. Samsung has tried to simplify the calibration process for the latest addition to its monitor lineup by handling everything through an app on your phone. The built-in color calibration engine ensures precise screen color and brightness, allowing users to adjust white balance, gamma, and RGB color balance for perfect accuracy with their smartphones through the Samsung Smart Calibration application, the company wrote in its press release. How well that works in practice, we'll need to see for ourselves. As is typically the case with CIS product announcements, Samsung isn't sharing any pricing details on the Viewfinity S9 yet, but says it will ship early this year. Apple Studio Display, which is also 27 inches, starts at $1,599 when configured with the standard glossy screen. My gut says that Samsung will undercut that with its stylish 5K display, but it'll be interesting to see just how aggressive the price is. Stay tuned for our first-hand impressions of the Viewfinity S9 from CIS 2012. The Verge is 2022 in review, the best and worst in entertainment and science The Verge. The Verge is 2022 in review we look back at some of the best and the worst of the year in entertainment, gaming, and science. Nobody can say that 2022 was an uneventful year. But if you wanted to escape reality, occasionally by playing a really great game, enjoying a fantastic movie, or marathoning an exciting series, there were plenty of options to be found. Now that the end of the year is approaching, we thought we'd add share our recommendations and thoughts from 2022.
We've got roundups of our favorite movies and series from Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Amazon Prime, and a variety of other streaming services, along with our best-loved games for the Switch, Xbox, PC, and other devices. We also offer our thoughts on some of the best and worst tech that the year... Google's new ad hub offers more control over the advertising it shows you The Verge. After announcing it back at Google I slash O in May, Google is beginning to roll out a hub this week that it says will give you more control over which ads it shows you and what data it uses to target them. Once it rolls out, the My Ad Center hub will be accessible at mutchenter.google.com or via the three-dot menu button on ads shown in Google Search, Discover, and YouTube services. According to a blog post from Google VP and General Manager for Ads Jerry Dishler, available controls will include the ability to increase or decrease the amount of advertising you see on certain brands and topics, to blacklist certain sensitive topics, including alcohol, dating, and weight loss, or to opt out of ad personalization entirely. Dishler gives the example of opting out of ads for vacations if you're seeing a lot of them after shopping for a trip you've already taken. The My Ad Center hub also includes settings to control exactly which information Google uses to target ads in the first place. You'll be able to adjust which audience categories Google thinks you're a part of think relationship or education status, for example. There's also the option of telling the company not to personalize ads based on your YouTube history or web and app activity, without losing access to the useful features these settings provide when they're enabled Gizmodo reports. Some of these controls aren't entirely new. The search giant has long given users the option of influencing the advertising it serves them by, for example opting out of personalized ads or personalizing which traits and interests it uses for targeting. But My Ad Center is designed to offer a dedicated central hub with these controls in a single place, which should make them more manageable to use. According to the search giant, this customization applies across whichever device you're signed into with your Google account, as well as across other sites and apps that use Google's advertising tools. Gizmo Media Inc. What is Gizmo? 
Integrated plus digital plus interactive plus data-driven Gizmo Media Inc. is an omni-channel marketing and media company that connects consumer electronics, brands and services with potential customers. We attract, aggregate and engage consumers to try, learn about and buy Qi and Qi-related products, services and experiences. We use a 360-degree method to introduce, market, and sell consumer electronics and tech lifestyle brands. Our experiential approach integrates interactive digital and traditional media with physical outlets to make technology understandable, fun and exciting. Our mission we pledge to make technology friendly accessible to everyone. We dissolve frustration and confusion around the latest innovations in consumer electronics using all media platforms, interactive experiences and community participation. And have fun doing it. We're committed to our process. Engage, entertain, educate, empower. We know you have problems. Despite allocating $70 billion to advertising, Qi manufacturers and lifestyle brands are struggling to break through media channel clutter. Gizmo fixes that. We put your products and services every place consumers live, work, play and shop. We extend your reach to all media platforms, adding hands-on product education and fresh, engaging experiences that lead to purchase. With Gizmo, high-tech goes high-touch to maximize reach, frequency, and engagement, yielding sales and data. For Qi and tech lifestyle brands, we provide marketing, sales, and research. For consumers, we're a trusted resource to hear about, try, and buy Qi. Gizmo's comprehensive method reaches your prospects where they are. We guide them through the profusion of choices, clarify product complexity, and provide access to new tech test drives. A better media buy. Extended outreach. We showcase your brand on all media platforms and incorporate interactivity and digital tools to celebrate the digital tech lifestyle web, mobile, print, video programming, retail, out of home, pop-ups, street teams, immersive experiences, our technology. Friendly. Trademark sign inclusive approach is a better way to market Qi. We believe in the mass market, not just early adopter hipsters. Brand partners also appreciate that Gizmo's modular structure ensures we can easily address specific or multiple vertical markets. Customize your outreach have something special in mind. Need an extra hand to realize a campaign? We can help mix and match services from our business units to create a specific program that perfectly fits your objectives. Builds and operates demo pavilions, pop-ups, roadshows, and other retail, out-of-home or location-based events. Marketing creative and campaign execution, including media placement, collaterals, cross-promotions and special events slash media support. Produces video and interactive content for distribution over our 360 network and a full spectrum of media outlets. Data collection and research, including focus groups, trends analysis, data packaging. Be seen. Be heard and capture valuable data in the process. Our consumer affinity program, Gizmo Nation, ties all of our outreach platforms together. In the nation social media club, consumers get exclusive offers, discounts and giveaways on the latest Gizmos, plus other cool loot and fun stuff. Opportunities to test drive new products, sound off and submit video reviews, and vote for their faves in polls and forums. Compete to become Avip Gizmo Ambassador or Gizmo TV Star. Invitations to participate in Gizmo Red Carpet and other Gizmo members only events. Like celebrity meet and greet, video game competitions or Oscar night at the mall. Contact US have a suggestion. Need some help? Want to work together? We're always glad to hear from you. Gizmo Media Inc. 2118 Wilshire Boulevard. Suite 990, Santa Monica, CA 90403.
was a frustrating wait for passengers travelling through Ninoy Aquino International Airport on New Year's Day. A power outage jolted air traffic control, forcing the Philippines' main gateway to close. I flew from Istanbul to come here. I've already been waiting 10 hours for my connecting flight to Cebu. I'm very stressed from all the waiting and the long queues. Three Russian personnel killed in drone attack on Ingalls Air Base, southeast of Moscow, ABC News. Three Russian military personnel have been killed by the falling wreckage of a Ukrainian drone after it was shot down over an air base in the... ABC search. Search the ABC Philippines main airport closes due to power outage. The power outage has seen more than 360 domestic and international flights to and from Manila's Ninoy Aquino International Airport to be delayed, canceled or diverted. Point nine h ago, nine hours ago, 2 3rd January 2023 at 6.43 AMAB News. Andrew Tate and online misogynists a court in Romania has ordered that controversial social media influencer Andrew Tate and his brother be held for 30 days in pre-trial detention for alleged sex trafficking, rape and forming an organized crime group. Yesterday, 2nd January 2023, at 7.03 AMAB Radio National, the year in tech with Sulet Dreyfus, two words for you, Elon Musk. Do we need to say anything else? It's been a whirlwind two months for the self-declared chief twit and his social experiment in the town square otherwise known as Twitter. But now he's resigning. It caps off a very eventful year for Tech News.27 Deck 202227 December 2022 to 27 December 2022 at 11.43 AMAB Radio National. The Friday wrap it's the last wrap of the year. Year one stop shop for all the big news off the week.16 Deck 202216 December 2022 free 16th December 2022 at 651 PMAB. The Friday Wrap ABC Radio National. It's the last wrap of the year. You're once... 6 people including 2 police officers have been shot dead in rural Queensland. We are an organisation in mourning tonight. The Albanese government is ending the year celebrating the passage of its energy market intervention bill. We believe that Australian households and small businesses deserve this support. Hugo Chalmers over there is going to have complete uh, order. control. The member for Hume will refer to members by their correct title. And yet at $12 a gigajoule... The profit across the spectrum of Australia's gas fields will sit at somewhere between four and eight dollars. So spare me the performative histrionics. The AAT's public standing has been irreversibly damaged as a result of the actions of the former government over nine years. This election has really sort of turned out to be a battle between two former coup leaders, Frank Bainimarama and Sidibeni Rambuka. And the World Cup final 2022. France to hold us against Argentina. We apologise for the extreme, inhumane acts committed against you. 
a wrap. <laughs> wrap. Joining me now for the very last wrap of the week's news for 2022 are Annika Smethurst, State Politics Editor at The Age, and Greg Sheridan, Foreign Editor for The Australian. Welcome to you both. Good to be with you, Kath. Well, let's start with the big news of the day today, quite the uh, policy drop for a Friday in December. As you just heard in the previous interview, the government has axed the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Annika, is Mark Dreyfus right to do this? Has the AAT become too politicised? Is its reputation irreversibly damaged? Look, I do think it was at risk of that. I don't think it was perhaps beyond uh, repair. Um, and in many ways, um, I've seen many governments over the years uh, end a certain thing and replace it with something else and you end up with something very similar. So um, I'm, I may sound like a cynic, but I don't have great hope for it being um, a huge reform. But I do think there were problems with, I guess, the optics of it. There was something like 85 former Liberal MPs who had, had been put on it. Uh, we know staffers often end up on it. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I'm actually quite a defender of politicians um, using their skills after they leave office. I, I did a story a few years ago um, about a number of politicians who struggled to get a job outside of um, parliament. And often, not all of them, a lot of them do have actually really good skills, good knowledge about, you know, how things work. Um, and I, I don't think necessarily we should, you know, get to the stage where we think just putting them um, in roles. I, I note the government elected Jenny Macklin to something today. You know, these people have often given a big service to the country and their skills can be used. But I do think uh, in this case, uh, it was getting to the stage where it was seen as somewhere you went if you lost your seat or lost pre-selection or you were owed a favour by somebody and it did need to be reformed. I just don't know. Um, I guess I don't hold great hope that we're going to end up with something vastly better. Mm. Greg, do you think this is just going to wash over the heads of most Australians? I mean, the vast majority probably don't know what the AAT does, nor will they ever have anything to do with it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the AAT is a body of sublime um, insignificance and obscurity. But I think it was a poor show by the government to abolish it. It's not a good practice for one government to get into office and say, OK, the other mob were in office for nine years. They made all the appointments. So instead of just appointing all of our mates, which is what they're going to do over the next however many years we're in office, we're going to abolish the body so that way we can effectively sack all of the other side's appointees. Labor is much more ruthless about appointing ideological friends than the Liberals are. The Liberals are absolutely inclined to give their mates jobs, but there's there's not much political or ideological quality to it, whereas Labor ruthlessly creates and captures culture-forming ideological bodies and and staffs them relentlessly with uh, people who share the same worldview as they do. Now, the poor old libs certainly gave a lot of their, their mates jobs at the AAT, but I, th I think it's a bit like this practice we've got into of holding royal commissions into the previous government's policies. Now, the Liberals were worse at this. They really started it than Labor, but it's a very bad policy. You know, the previous government's policies have been adjudicated by the electorate. Uh, so you don't need to quasi-criminalise them. And similarly, you shouldn't just abolish a body because uh, the other side appointed people to it. You're mm. going to appoint all the new people to it. That's uh, that's good enough. OK, well, moving on to uh, the other issue that's taken up a lot of oxygen this week, that is obviously the energy intervention uh, that the government has successfully p uh, passed in, in Parliament. Annika, I suppose you, you could forgive them for feeling a little giddy after the week that they've had. They promised intervention in the energy market and this week they delivered. But do you think they've actually delivered something that will deliver a meaningful relief to people and business? Uh, look, it, it it will make bills less. I, I think that is one thing. But you, this is you've got to put this in context of mm. during the election, we had Anthony Albanese stand there and promise to save Australians $275 annually on their energy bill. Now, since May, we all know anyone that's opened an electricity or gas bill uh, without gasping. Um, it has just been incredible, you know, the price rises we've seen. And um, that can be blamed on, you know, the Ukraine and all these other things. At the end of the day, by May, we sort of knew what was um, happening over there. And the promise has been doubled down on over and over again too, even as recently as during the budget. So... Uh, they had to do something. Um, it, it 
if you look at the sort of projections for next year, and I say that cautiously because they haven't necessarily been accurate um, in previous budgets, but if you look where they're going to go, they're still going to rise significantly. But I guess this means, you know, it look at between instead of power bills rising 60 to 70 percent, it might go up 40 percent next year. Um, politically, though, I think they really had to do something because so far the Albanese government hasn't hasn't made too many missteps. Um, you wouldn't expect that from an early uh, government, but um, there have been notable examples where in the first six months governments have sort of made themselves a big target. This was an area where they were vulnerable. I think that promise, that $275 annually to the energy bills, you know, by 2025 that Anthony Albanese promised during the election could have come back to haunt him. So they really didn't have much option here but to do something. I just think in terms of voters, and, you know, this is my job not to say whether I think a policy is good, it's, it's how it will land in, you know, the public. Mm. I do think you don't often get rewarded for things that you sort of relief you bring but if you if you have to explain to people how much worse it could have been it's like during COVID you know we often heard um, Scott Morrison or Josh Frydenberg say well if we didn't do this this would have happened and this mm. many people would have died and you know if we didn't introduce JobKeeper this would have happened when it was being criticised and it, it, it's very hard politically to say well it could, we, your life could have been a lot worse and we did this thing to make it a little bit better but it's still hard we get that mm. so I do think 